Joe Biden isolated as France and Germany allow Ukraine to fire into Russia. Joe Biden finds himself isolated as France and Germany allow Ukraine to use their weapons to target Russia, a move the U.S. has refused to endorse. Emmanuel Macron announced that Ukraine could utilize high-powered French weapons, such as their versions of storm shadows, to strike across the border. This declaration was made alongside German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who displayed a map indicating Russian bases used in attacks against Ukraine. While Scholz was more cautious, he acknowledged Ukraine's right under international law to use Western equipment for self-defense against attacks originating from Russian territory. The U.S. now stands alone as most Western allies, including the U.K., have relaxed their restrictions. U.S.-supplied weapons are considered crucial for countering Russian advances, particularly along the northern border near Kharkiv. We must enable the Ukrainians to neutralize the military sites from which they are attacked, Macron stated during his visit to Germany. However, he emphasized that civilian targets within Russia should not be hit. If we tell the Ukrainians, you can't strike the launch sites, we're essentially saying, we're giving you weapons, but you can't defend yourselves, he added. Scholz supported the notion that Ukraine has every right to defend itself under international law, even suggesting that German weapons could be used near the border for strikes within Russia. The debate over targeting Russian soil has intensified, especially after Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky highlighted the difficulty of countering Russian troops poised on the border before new offensives. Zelensky, during a visit to Belgium, stressed the need for permission to use Western arms against Russian territory to maintain support from international partners. Ukraine has frequently used Western weapons, like U.S.-supplied HIMARS rocket launchers, to target Russian forces in occupied areas. British and French donated Storm Shadow missiles have also been employed against Russian ammunition and fuel depots. However, an American embargo on striking Russian soil has enabled Russia to conduct long-range attacks from within its borders. Despite growing pressure on Washington to lift this embargo, there has been little change. White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby reiterated, Our position remains unchanged. We do not encourage or permit the use of U.S.-supplied weapons to strike Russian soil. This stance has reignited debates on the extent of autonomous use of donated weapons. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has called for a reassessment of these restrictions, arguing they hinder Ukraine's defensive capabilities. EU nations remain divided, with the UK, Baltic states, Finland, and Poland supporting strikes on Russian targets, while the US, Italy, and Germany express concerns about provoking Russia, a nuclear power. These differing positions have led to accusations from the Kremlin of direct escalation, raising fears of a broader conflict among some NATO members. Putin warns West of serious consequences if Ukraine strikes Russian soil. Russian President Vladimir Putin issued a stern warning on Tuesday, cautioning Western countries about serious consequences if they allow Ukraine to use their weapons to strike Russian territory. This constant escalation can lead to serious consequences, Putin stated in Uzbekistan, according to multiple news agencies. This warning comes amid increasing pressure from some NATO members and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky for Ukraine to be permitted to strike Russian soil directly. The United States has not advocated for such actions. If these serious consequences occur in Europe, how will the United States react, considering our strategic weapons parity? Putin questioned. Do they want a global conflict? Putin highlighted that using long-range weapons against Russia would depend on Western intelligence data implying NATO military personnel's involvement in the attacks. He cautioned strongly against such a scenario. NATO member countries, especially in Europe, should be aware of what they are dealing with, Putin emphasized. Countries with small territories and dense populations should be particularly cautious, he warned. Ukraine's ongoing struggle against Russia's significant offensive in the Kharkiv region has brought attention to the ban on using U.S. weapons to target Russia as a crucial issue Kyiv wants to overturn. Some Ukrainian officials have argued that Russia's attacks launched from the Belgorod region could have been mitigated if they were allowed to target that Russian province. A group of five Ukrainian parliament members recently traveled to Washington to meet with Biden administration officials and lawmakers, urging the U.S. to lift the ban. It's like if someone attacked Washington, D.C., from Virginia, 
And you said we're not going to hit Virginia, explained David Arakamiya, head of a Ukrainian parliamentary group on U.S. relations. It's crazy. Military leaders don't understand. They push us politicians to stop this policy. It's insane. During a visit to Kyiv, Secretary of State Antony Blinken reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to helping Ukraine win the war against Russia but emphasized that Kyiv should focus on reclaiming its territory. Ukraine must decide how to conduct this war, defending its freedom, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, Blinken stated. We've been clear about our own policy. EU establishes AI office to regulate technology under new law. The European Union announced on Wednesday the creation of an AI office, staffed with tech experts, lawyers, and economists, to regulate artificial intelligence under a newly enacted comprehensive law. This year, the EU approved the world's first extensive AI regulations, particularly targeting powerful systems like OpenAI's ChatGPT, following prolonged and intense negotiations. Originally proposed in 2021, the law was fast-tracked after ChatGPT's 2022 debut, which amazed users with its ability to generate coherent text, including poems, in seconds. The AI office aims to promote the development, deployment, and use of AI in ways that enhance societal and economic benefits and innovation while minimizing risks, stated the European Commission. The AI office, consisting of 140 members, will be part of the Commission, the EU's executive branch and primary tech regulator. The office will nurture a European AI ecosystem that is innovative, competitive, and adherent to EU rules and values, said Thierry Breton, the EU's chief tech enforcer. The AI Act imposes stringent regulations on general-purpose AI systems like ChatGPT, adopting a risk-based approach to the technology. The higher the risk to individuals' rights or health, the greater the obligations on the systems to protect against harms. Collaborating with developers and the scientific community, the office will evaluate and test general-purpose AI to ensure it serves humanity and upholds European values, said Margrethe Vestager, the Commission's Executive Vice President. Companies are required to comply with the EU's law by 2026, but rules for AI models like ChatGPT will take effect 12 months after the law is officially enacted. The EU's announcement coincided with criticism from EU auditors, who accused the Commission of insufficient investment in AI to meet the bloc's goals. Stronger governance and more, and better targeted, public and private investment in the EU are crucial for achieving the bloc's AI ambitions, stated the EU's spending watchdog. In response, the Commission defended its record, noting it invests over 1 billion euros, 1.1 billion dollars, annually in AI research projects through various schemes. Iran says Saudi Arabia expelled six journalists ahead of Hajj after detaining them. Iran announced on Wednesday that Saudi Arabia had expelled six journalists from its state television network after detaining them for nearly a week in the kingdom ahead of the Hajj pilgrimage. Saudi authorities claimed the journalists were violating the terms of their visas. This incident occurs a year after Saudi Arabia and Iran reached a détente mediated by China although tensions between the Sunni and Shiite powers have persisted for decades, particularly regarding the holy sites in Saudi Arabia. Iranian state TV reported that the detentions began over a week ago when three crew members were arrested while recording a Quranic reading at the Prophet Muhammad's mosque in Medina. The network provided no details on the cause of their detention but noted that after several hours of questioning, the men were held at a police detention center. Two days later, Saudi police detained a journalist from Iran's Arabic-language Al-Alam channel and another state TV journalist as they attended a prayer service with Iranian pilgrims. Another radio journalist was detained at a hotel in Medina, according to state TV. The six journalists were eventually released and expelled to Iran, preventing them from participating in the Hajj pilgrimage, which is obligatory for all able-bodied Muslims once in their lifetime. This expulsion followed efforts by Iran's state TV and foreign ministry to secure their release. Iranian state TV asserted that the journalists had committed no crime and that their detention was unjustified. They were performing their regular duties when this occurred, and they were arrested, said Payman Jabeli, head of Iran's state broadcaster, Islamic Republic of Iran Broadcasting. We are unaware of the reasons for their arrest and expulsion. 
Saudi Arabia's Center for International Communication informed the Associated Press that the Iranians had entered the kingdom on visas permitting only the Hajj pilgrimage, not journalistic work. They engaged in activities that are incompatible with the type of visas granted to them, violating the kingdom's residency regulations, the center stated. Both Iran and Saudi Arabia are rated as not free by the Washington-based organization Freedom House, scoring zero in the metric for a free and independent press. Iran, the largest Shiite Muslim nation, and Sunni-majority Saudi Arabia severed diplomatic ties in 2016 following the execution of prominent Saudi Shiite cleric Nimr al-Nimr by Saudi Arabia. In response, angry Iranians stormed Saudi diplomatic missions in Iran. Last year, ties were restored through Chinese mediation, even though Saudi Arabia remains embroiled in a prolonged conflict with Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. Previously, Saudi Arabia severed ties with Iran from 1988 to 1991 due to rioting during the Hajj in 1987 and Iran's attacks on Persian Gulf shipping. This diplomatic freeze led to a halt in Iranian pilgrimages to the Hajj. More recently, Iranian pilgrims were temporarily barred from attending Hajj amid escalating tensions. Iran has historically insisted that its pilgrims be allowed to hold large-scale disavowal of infidels, ceremonies, rallies denouncing Israel and Saudi Arabia's ally, the United States. Saudi Arabia, however, bans political demonstrations at the Hajj, which draws about two million Muslims from around the globe. Yemen's Houthis claim attacks on six ships across three seas. Yemen's Houthi group announced on Wednesday that they launched attacks on six ships across three different seas. Among the targeted vessels was the Marshall Islands flagged bulk carrier LOX, which reported damage from a missile strike off the Yemeni coast. Security and shipping sources confirmed the how this attack on the LOX amid a series of assaults on Tuesday. In a televised statement, the Houthis claimed responsibility for targeting the Morea and Sea Lady in the Red Sea, the Alba and Maersk Hartford in the Arabian Sea, and the Minerva Antonia in the Mediterranean. However, Ed Hanley, chief operating officer of U.S.-based Maersk Line, clarified that the U.S.-flagged Maersk Hartford container ship was not attacked. I can't speak to the other five ships, but the Hartford is fine, Hanley said in an interview. Nothing happened. Attempts to reach the registered owners of the other vessels for comment were unsuccessful. The Houthis stated that their attacks are acts of solidarity with Palestinians amid the ongoing conflict in Gaza. Since November, they have carried out repeated drone and missile strikes in the Red Sea region and have now extended their attacks to other critical waterways. The attacks on Tuesday coincided with Israeli tanks advancing into the heart of Rafah, despite an order from the International Court of Justice to cease attacks on the city, which has become a refuge for many Palestinians. Five missiles from Yemen struck the locks, which was transporting grain. Despite the damage, the vessel continued its journey and the crew remained safe, according to the ship's security company, LSS Sapu. The vessel has sustained damage, but it is not taking on water, not tilting, and there are no injuries on board, a spokesperson from LSS Sapu said. It is proceeding to its destination at normal speed. The spokesperson noted that the Greece-based owner of the LOX has no connections with Israel or the United States. The LOX last reported its position on May 28, en route to Bundar Imam Khomeini in Iran, according to LSEG shipping data. The Houthis have vowed to attack any ships headed towards Israeli ports, including in the Mediterranean, and have identified vessels affiliated with the US and UK as targets. The Houthi campaign has previously resulted in the sinking of the Rubimar, the seizure of another vessel, and the death of three crew members in separate incidents. This campaign has disrupted global shipping, forcing vessels to avoid the Suez Canal and reroute trade around Africa. France criticizes allies for political positioning in recognizing Palestinian state. On Wednesday, France's foreign minister accused fellow EU members Spain and Ireland of recognizing Palestinian statehood as a form of political positioning, rather than a genuine effort to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This criticism follows Spain, Ireland, and Norway's official recognition of the state of Palestine on Tuesday, which prompted a strong reaction from Israel. French President Emmanuel Macron stated that while he is open to recognizing a Palestinian state, such a decision should be made at a useful moment 
and not driven by emotion. Foreign Minister Stefan Sojourn addressed senators, emphasizing France's support for a two-state solution, where Israel and Palestine would coexist peacefully. The issue of recognition will naturally be part of this process, Sojourn said. But the main concern, which I have discussed with my Spanish and Irish counterparts, is the practical impact of such recognition. How useful is it diplomatically? Sojourn further stated, France is not engaging in political positioning. It seeks diplomatic solutions to the crisis. It's regrettable that some European states prioritize political positioning in the context of the upcoming European elections, which does not solve the issue. The European Parliament elections are scheduled for next week. What exactly has Spain's recognition changed in Gaza the following day? Nothing, Sojourn remarked. The latest conflict in Gaza began after the militant group Hamas's unprecedented attack on southern Israel on October 7, resulting in 1,189 deaths, mostly civilians, according to an AFP tally based on Israeli official figures. Militants also took 252 hostages, with 121 still in Gaza, including 37 declared dead by the Israeli army. Israel's retaliatory offensive has resulted in at least 36,171 deaths in Gaza, mostly civilians, as reported by the Hamas-run health ministry. The Israeli military reports that 292 soldiers have been killed since the ground offensive began on October 27. Philippines President Calls China's New Coast Guard Rules Worrisome Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. expressed concern on Wednesday about new regulations introduced by China's Coast Guard that could lead to the detention of foreigners in the South China Sea, calling them an escalation and worrisome. China, which is engaged in maritime sovereignty disputes with the Philippines and other nations, has implemented new rules effective June 15 to enforce a 2021 Coast Guard law allowing for the detention of foreigners suspected of trespassing. The new policy of threatening to detain our own citizens is different. It is an escalation of the situation, Marcos remarked during a state visit to Brunei. Marcos affirmed that the Philippines will use any point of contact with China to halt aggressive actions and to ensure Filipino fishermen can operate in the South China Sea. He added, if aggressive actions are managed, then we can all go about our business in a peaceful way. China frequently accuses vessels of trespassing in the South China Sea, including areas within the exclusive economic zones of its neighbors, leading to repeated clashes with the Philippines over the past year. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs stated on Wednesday that the new rules are intended to standardize law enforcement and uphold maritime order. There is no need for any individual or entity to worry as long as there is no illegal behavior, said Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning during a regular press conference. Mao accused the Philippines of frequently provoking escalations in the South China Sea and emphasized that China remains open to dialogue. Marcos has adopted a firmer stance compared to his predecessor regarding China's activities in the South China Sea, supported by defense allies such as the United States, Japan, and Australia. Beijing claims jurisdiction over most of the South China Sea, a crucial route for over $3 trillion in annual shipborne trade. However, a 2016 International Arbitral Tribunal ruling stated that China's extensive claims have no basis under international law, a decision China has rejected. Beijing insists that historic records and old maps validate its sovereignty over the majority of the sea and its many islands. North Korea fires multiple short-range ballistic missiles amid rising tensions. North Korea launched a series of short-range ballistic missiles early Thursday according to Seoul's military, following an incident where Pyongyang sent hundreds of trash-filled balloons across the border to antagonize South Korea. This launch comes after North Korea's failed attempt to deploy a second spy satellite into orbit on Monday, coinciding with a rare summit between Seoul, Beijing, and Tokyo, where leaders urged Pyongyang to abandon its nuclear weapons program. Kim Jong-un's influential sister described the balloon attack, which reportedly contained animal feces, as sincere presence for South Korea, stating it was justified retaliation against anti-Kim propaganda sent north by activists. North Korea also criticized the UN Security Council, which plans to meet on Friday to discuss the failed satellite launch that violated multiple UN sanctions regarding Pyongyang's use of ballistic technology. 
Seoul's military detected the launch of approximately 10 short-range ballistic missiles fired into the waters east of the Korean peninsula early Thursday. The missiles traveled around 350 kilometers, 217 miles, according to Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff, who called the launch a provocation and are analyzing the details in coordination with the United States and Japan. Japan confirmed the launch, with Prime Minister Fumio Kishida stating the ballistic missiles appeared to have fallen outside of Japan's exclusive economic zone. Kishida condemned the launch and said Japan had lodged a protest. Kishida was in Seoul on Monday for a trilateral summit with South Korea's President Yoon suk yeol and Chinese Premier Li Chang, where they reiterated their commitment to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea responded that even discussing denuclearization was a grave provocation, violating its constitution, which was amended in 2023 to establish its status as a nuclear state. Hours later, it attempted the satellite launch, which was condemned by Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo. Following the launch, Pyongyang sent balloons across the border and then fired the ballistic missiles on Thursday. It is unprecedented that such a large number of short-range missiles were fired simultaneously, said Hong Min, a senior analyst at the Korea Institute for National Unification in Seoul. It appears to be North Korea's protest against the denuclearization pledge from the summit and the UN Security Council meeting on its satellite launch, he added. Experts note significant technological overlap between space launch capabilities and ballistic missile development. Launching a reconnaissance satellite has been a high priority for Kim's regime, which claimed success in November after two failed attempts the previous year. However, the recent launch failed due to a suspected engine problem. In a speech, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un urged perseverance despite the setback. Although we failed to achieve our desired results, we must not be discouraged but make greater efforts, he said, stressing the importance of learning from failure. Additionally, North Korea released a statement criticizing UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres ahead of the Security Council meeting. A North Korean foreign ministry official defended the satellite launch as essential for self-defense. Seoul claims that North Korea received Russian technical assistance for its successful November launch in exchange for sending weapons to Moscow for use in Ukraine. North Korea escalates tensions with trash balloons as Kim pushes satellite ambitions. North Korea launched hundreds of balloons carrying trash and manure toward South Korea in an unusual act of provocation, prompting South Korea's military to deploy chemical and explosive response teams to recover the debris. This balloon campaign occurred as North Korean leader Kim Jong-un urged his military scientists to persevere after a failed satellite launch. He emphasized the importance of developing space-based reconnaissance to counter U.S. and South Korean military activities, as reported by state media on Wednesday. In his first public remarks on the launch failure, Kim also threatened unspecified, overwhelming actions against South Korea criticizing a recent exercise involving 20 fighter jets near the inter-Korean border as a direct military challenge. Kim condemned the exercise in a speech on Tuesday, referring to it as a hysterical attack formation flight and strike drill. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff reported that since Tuesday night, North Korea has flown numerous balloons carrying trash toward the south, retaliating against South Korean activists who sent anti-North Korean propaganda leaflets across the border. As of Wednesday afternoon, about 260 North Korean balloons were discovered in various locations in South Korea. The South Korean military, assisted by rapid response and explosive clearance teams, is recovering the balloons, which contained various types of trash and manure, though no human excrement has been found. Civilians were advised not to touch the debris and to report it to the authorities. North Korean Vice Defense Minister Kim Kong-il announced over the weekend that the North planned to scatter mounds of waste paper and filth over South Korea as a tit-for-tat response to the leafleting by South Korean activists. Kim Yo-jong, Kim Jong-un's sister, mocked South Korea's military for demanding that the North cease its inhumane and vulgar activity. She claimed the North was simply exercising its freedom of expression criticizing South Korea's inability to stop activists from sending leaflets north. Once you experience how nasty and exhausting it feels to go around picking up dirty filth, you will realize that you shouldn't talk about freedom of expression so easily when it comes to leafleting in border areas, she said.
We will make it clear that we will respond with ten times the amount of filth to what the South Koreans spray at us in the future. Photos from South Korea's military showed trash scattered across highways and roads. In Seoul, officials found what appeared to be a timer likely designed to pop the bags of trash midair. In South Chungcheong Province, two large balloons carrying unpopped bags filled with dirt-like substances were discovered on a road. There have been no reports of damage caused by the balloons. However, similar activities by North Korea damaged cars and property in 2016. Kim Jong-un's comments about the satellite came from a speech at the Academy of Defense Sciences, a day after a rocket carrying what would have been North Korea's second military reconnaissance satellite exploded shortly after liftoff. The failure was attributed to issues with a newly developed rocket engine using petroleum and liquid oxygen. Tensions between the Koreas have escalated significantly, with increased weapons demonstrations by North Korea and intensified combined military exercises between South Korea, the U.S., and Japan since 2022. The failed satellite launch was a setback for Kim's plan to launch three more military spy satellites in 2024. The November launch of North Korea's first military reconnaissance satellite followed two failed attempts earlier. The recent launch was condemned by South Korea, Japan, and the United States, as the UN prohibits North Korea from such launches, viewing them as disguised tests for long-range missile technology. North Korea maintains its right to launch satellites and test missiles in response to perceived U.S.-led military threats. Kim has called spy satellites essential for monitoring U.S. and South Korean military activities and bolstering the threat posed by North Korea's nuclear-capable missiles. Although we failed to achieve the results we had hoped to get in the recent reconnaissance satellite launch, we must never feel scared or dispirited but make still greater efforts, Kim said. It is natural that one learns more and makes greater progress after experiencing failure. North Korea has not specified when it will attempt another satellite launch, which experts say could take months. The mention of a liquid oxygen petroleum rocket engine indicates an effort to develop more powerful space launch vehicles for larger payloads, according to South Korean experts. Taiwan reports new Chinese military activity after war games. Taiwan reported fresh Chinese military activity nearby on Wednesday, stating that China's warships and aircraft were conducting joint combat readiness patrols less than a week after Beijing concluded two days of military exercises. China stated that the war games, which began last Thursday, were conducted as a punishment for President Lai Ching Te's inauguration speech, in which he asserted that the two sides of the Taiwan Strait were not subordinate to each other, a declaration China interpreted as a claim of separate statehood. China considers Taiwan its own territory and has never ruled out the use of force to bring it under its control. President Lai rejects China's sovereignty claims, insisting that only Taiwan's people can determine their future and has repeatedly proposed talks with Beijing, which have been consistently rebuffed. Taiwan's defense ministry reported that starting from 3.20 p.m. 0720 GMT on Wednesday, it detected 28 Chinese military aircraft, including Su-30 fighters, conducting joint combat readiness patrols in conjunction with warships near Taiwan. Eighteen of these aircraft crossed the median line of the Taiwan Strait or nearby areas, entering airspace to the north, center, and southwest of Taiwan. Speaking to reporters earlier in the day, Taiwan's National Security Bureau Director General Tsai Ming-yen stated that the purpose of China's drills last week was not to initiate a war but to intimidate. The goal of the military exercises was intimidation, he remarked. The drills aimed to demonstrate to both domestic and international audiences that Beijing has absolute control over the situation in the Taiwan Strait, Tsai added. In Beijing, Zhu Fenglian, spokesperson for China's Taiwan Affairs Office, reiterated China's objections to President Lai's support for Taiwan's formal independence and warned of continued Chinese military activity. She described the drills as a just action to defend national sovereignty and territorial integrity in response to Taiwan's provocations for independence. Taiwan's government maintains that Taiwan is already an independent country, known as the Republic of China. However, China insists that decisions regarding Taiwan's future concern all of China's 1.4 billion people, not just Taiwan's 23 million residents. China has been regularly deploying its military near Taiwan over the past four years, 
aiming to exert pressure on the island. However, Taiwan's National Security Bureau noted that China appeared to be attempting to limit the scope of these recent drills, as there were no declared no-fly or no-sail zones, and the exercises lasted only two days. Nonetheless, Taiwan expressed concerns that China might continue its coercive actions in the future, gradually altering the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. U.S. names new representative to Taiwan amid rising tensions. Amid escalating tensions and increased threats from China against Taiwan, the United States has appointed a new representative to the island. This move comes as China intensifies its pressure on Taiwan following the election of a new president who advocates for the island's de facto independence. China asserts sovereignty over Taiwan and recently conducted naval and air force drills near the island, simulating a blockade. The American Institute in Taiwan, functioning as the de facto embassy in Taipei, announced on Wednesday that veteran diplomat Raymond Green would succeed Sandra Oudkirk as the new representative starting in the summer of 2024. Although the U.S. formally severed diplomatic ties with Taiwan in 1979 in favor of recognizing the People's Republic of China, it remains Taiwan's staunchest ally. Under a 1979 law, the U.S. is committed to assisting Taiwan in defending itself against invasion threats. Despite China's intimidation tactics, life in Taiwan continues normally. However, political debates center around legal changes that could potentially enable the Nationalist Party to collaborate more closely with China's Communist Party, potentially jeopardizing Taiwan's international standing and its thriving high-tech economy. Since assuming office on May 20, Taiwanese President Lai ching te has called on Beijing to cease its military intimidation affirming Taiwan's sovereignty as an independent nation where the people hold ultimate authority. Raymond Green, the newly appointed representative, has previously served as the deputy head of eight and held diplomatic roles in Tokyo and Washington, primarily focusing on economic relations. His appointment coincides with a delegation led by Senators Tammy Duckworth and Dan Sullivan, underscoring bipartisan support for Taiwan during these challenging times. Taiwan accuses China of encroaching on its territory and international space. According to Taiwanese Foreign Minister Lin Qielong, China's recent military drills and assertive maneuvers are attempts to encroach upon Taiwan's space and establish a new norm, raising concerns globally. China, asserting sovereignty over Taiwan, conducted two days of war games near the island shortly after the inauguration of Taiwan's new president Lai ching te whom Beijing accuses of promoting separatism. While the formal drills have ended, Taiwan reported continued Chinese military activities, including warplanes and warships conducting a joint combat readiness patrol on Wednesday. Lin expressed concern over China's diplomatic pressure, noting Taiwan's exclusion from international organizations like the World Health Organization meeting due to Chinese obstruction. Despite Taiwan's rejection, China insists Taiwan is its province without the rights of a sovereign state hindering its participation in international bodies. Lin highlighted China's unilateral opening of new air routes near Taiwan-controlled islands and the presence of Chinese Coast Guard ships near Taiwan's east coast during last week's exercises as examples of efforts to alter the status quo. China's Taiwan Affairs Office reiterated its complaints about President Lai's support for Taiwan's independence and warned of further military activities. President Lai has sought dialogue with China but has been rebuffed, emphasizing that Taiwan's future should be determined by its people. Lin emphasized that stability in the region is of global concern, stressing that the cross-strait issue extends beyond the Taiwan Strait and affects the entire region. Despite Taipei's assertion of Taiwan's independence as the Republic of China, established in 1949 after losing a civil war to Mao Zedong's communists, China considers Taiwan an internal matter. U.S. and allies nab cybercrime mastermind, sees millions in luxury goods in massive COVID fraud sting. In a major operation, the U.S. Justice Department announced the arrest of a 35-year-old Chinese national, Yun He Wang, in Singapore, alongside the seizure of millions in luxury assets, including sports cars and real estate. This crackdown targeted a global cybercriminal network accused of defrauding the U.S. government of billions during the COVID-19 pandemic. Wang stands accused of orchestrating a sprawling botnet, infecting computers worldwide, which facilitated various illegal activities such as bomb threats, dissemination of child exploitation materials, and financial fraud. 
Particularly, the botnet was exploited to submit fraudulent relief applications, resulting in approximately $5.9 billion in losses, as revealed by the Justice and Treasury Departments. The operation, characterized by the extravagant lifestyle funded by cybercrime proceeds, involved the seizure of assets worth about $4 million, including luxury watches and vehicles like Ferrari and Rolls-Royce, along with $30 million in real estate across multiple regions. Wang allegedly invested his earnings from the botnet in properties worldwide, as per the indictment unsealed in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Texas. Collaboration between law enforcement agencies in Singapore, Thailand, and the FBI facilitated this bust. While Wang's legal representation remains undisclosed, efforts are underway for his extradition to the U.S., with ongoing investigations into other potential suspects. Using virtual private networking, VPN, Wang and his associates allegedly spread malicious code, infecting millions of IP addresses globally, including over 600,000 in the U.S. These actions exploited vulnerabilities, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, targeting relief programs like the CARES Act, amounting to opportunistic fraud totaling billions. The Secret Service's appointment of a National Pandemic Fraud Recovery Coordinator underscores the severity of the issue, with ongoing investigations into tax and money laundering cases related to COVID-19 fraud, highlighting the magnitude of the challenge faced by authorities. Hong Kong's new security law targets Tiananmen Post's seventh arrest sparks international concerns. Hong Kong authorities made their seventh arrest under the new security law, detaining a 53-year-old woman for social media posts related to the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown. This arrest follows criticisms from the EU, suggesting that the law is stifling freedom of expression. The individuals arrested, including prominent activist Chow Hang Tung, are the first under the Safeguarding National Security Ordinance, which penalizes sedition with up to seven years in prison. The arrests are part of ongoing enforcement actions, with the possibility of further arrests not ruled out. Hong Kong once a sanctuary for Tiananmen commemorations, has seen a crackdown on dissent since Beijing's suppression of the 2019 pro-democracy protests. The EU has expressed concerns about the law's impact on rights and freedoms in Hong Kong, calling on authorities to protect these fundamental principles. Article 23, Hong Kong's second national security law, has faced criticism from the US, EU, Japan, and Britain. However, the Hong Kong government defends the law, stating that sedition laws do not hinder legitimate expression of opinions. Amnesty International has condemned the arrests as an attempt to silence dissent, while authorities claim they aim to prevent incitement against the government. The discussion of Tiananmen remains highly sensitive in mainland China, where censorship obscures awareness of the 1989 events.